Welcome to a new episode of Connected Data Unchained. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Ru Ming, who is one of the founders of TigerGraph. Ru Ming, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Yeah, my name is Ru Ming Jin. I'm a professor at Kent State University. Around the 10 years ago, I was have the opportunity to co-found TigerGraph. I actually have to return back to academics around 2000, early 2017. Until recently, I have the opportunity to look into how TigerGraph was working, you know, yeah. Awesome. So I know that you are working on the financial vertical for TigerGraph. What do you think are some of the key challenges faced by those financial institutions? Yeah. So most of the use cases TigerGraph is helping the customer to solve in financial uh, industry is about financial crime. You know, it's regarding to, you know, like transaction fraud or like account fraud. So, so different type of fraud. Part of the issue of those customer facing is really trying to connect their data, right? So, so they have a huge amount of data, including their customer data, including the, the, the all kinds of transactions, also the, the customer behavior. You know, all of those data was sort of distributed in different locations, and a lot of semantic was not explicitly described in relational database, mm -hmm. okay? So what TechGraph was helping on one side is really help them actually building a holistic view of their data by connecting their data from different data sources together. So that's number one. And then number two is this type of data is actually uh, huge. You know, we are talking about terabytes of terabytes data. When the customer was trying to actually trying to understand their data or dig into the complicated relationship of the data, if they were doing in relational database, they have to perform a large number of joins, okay, which is very time consuming. You know, so sometimes a simple query can run, you know, easily half an hour, an hour, you know, or even, even days. With TigerGraph, using Telegraph, you know, GSQL, this is on one set, which allows them to actually write sophisticated queries, which can take, you know, relational database drawn or relational database SQL query, you know, hundreds of lines. But those queries can be described in GSQL in a much concise way. Okay, so that's one, one of the major benefit. And secondly, those, when GSQL was executed in a Telegraph scalable engine, which can take, you know, easily take probably minutes or even seconds for the same query we were running for hours on the relational database. Got it. Got it. So there is, I believe, something more to it, as you described it to me before, which is around graph algorithms or machine learning models that are enabled through graph features that lend themselves really well to this vertical. Can you tell me a little bit more what kind of algorithms are we talking about here? Right, right. So what graph powered, I, I call graph powered analytic can do is exactly these two things, which I think is make a graph database very distinctive from the relational database. So on one side, we have this so-called graph algorithm. So this is a collection of algorithms which are running on sophisticated network or graph model. Uh, for instance, we talk about community detection, centrality, like a page rank type of algorithm or community discovery, or, or some other, you know, type of, you know, like, for instance, like uh, maximal flow. So those graph algorithms, if you were actually, you know, like even implementing on relational database, on SQL, which is impossible to do, okay, but also the, the performance. So on the other side, graph, which also enable developers of data scientists actually to write, to collect very sophisticated graph-based analytics. For instance, very easily, if you have a transaction, you want to identify within, you know, case drive neighborhood, how many blacklist users appear, right? So, so apparently the number of the, 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 the accounts which are uh, surrounding those transactions will significantly increase the chance of that fraud being, uh, will increase the, the transaction being fraud. Okay, so with Tiger Graph, the, the, the scientists can write, you know, like, tens or even hundreds of sophisticated graph features rather quickly. And to be able to actually running on the, on the, on the graph database very efficiently. 
and on a, very, on a terabyte of data, so large scale data. Okay, so once those graph features are being collected, they can continue to use in graph neural network or some other machine learning models to actually classify the transactions, classify or detect the user type. Got it, got it. That's, that's very, actually very interesting. Mm -hmm. If you were to think about just a couple of those algorithms, you mentioned community detection, centrality, and, and, and the page rank. Yeah. When you identify financial crime, such as transaction crime, how do you use those two algorithms specifically to help you identify fraudulent transactions? Right. To be, to be specific, I think the, for community detection, which usually when the when 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 the you know the, the data scientists analyze the data, they want to see for a given user what type of community they are in. So like so so one of the first step we 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 usually do is actually uh, partition the entire user into different communities. Then we're actually going to build the community level statistics or community level uh, stat uh, like features. And that was there was an interesting point that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. which is partition the user base in the bank into communities. Can you describe what does it what does it mean to have a community of users? Why did you how would you come up with that partition basically of the users, the cohort of users? Right, right, right. So this is really, you know, based on the use case, right? So so basically how user was like appear in, in the bank, for instance, how you know we look at for a group of densely connected users they usually form a community. Mm -hmm. You know, definitely, the defin you, you can imagine that the community definition is a loose concept, right? So, so the bank also, you know, usually they would understand, okay, so the user belongs to certain communities. That can be physical community or it can be virtual community. So mm -hmm. it's a very difficult way to define them precisely. So one of the advantage of using, you know, network or, or, or graph analytics is actually using you know community detection algorithms to discover those communities or what we call graph clusters which naturally appear in the data okay so so once you have the data once you have those clusters right you you will say okay for this group of users what are their common activities okay what are some sort of what are the usual activities we can collect those features and we can once we when we define the user like features, we not only have the individual features, we also have the community level features. Those apparently, when the, the, the you know, through the experiments, the data scientists have found those are, when, we, when they combine this together, you know, the, the accuracy of the machine learning algorithms can be improved. Got it, got it. So then we also talked about page rank, which I know is an algorithm that was used by Google as part of their search engine. How does it apply here? How do you use this concept of page rank here in, the, in this case? Yeah, I think in, you know, potentially page rank or the, you know, there's a, a list of other concepts, not necessarily for, for page rank, I believe we have more use case in supply chain, you know, just to, to, to annotate essentially what's the importance of a certain node, uh, but, mm -hmm. but, Similar statistics, they have been collected, you know, certain between so some additional features. Those just the data scientists, if they believe those potential like features can be useful for the for the machine learning task, so we can collect them, then we can use those features. So there's a lot of you can imagine there's a lot of those centrality type of features can be attached to the users. And some of them more auxiliary instead of, you know, to, to say, okay, instead of using as a deterministic factor. Yeah. Sure, got it. So we talked about graph algorithms and, 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 and how they're used to enrich the data and the, and the models, the machine learning models that are used to generate additional features to help with financial crime. But the question that comes to mind, why would the financial institute think about using a graph database above and beyond just the algorithms. Why can't they just do the same thing with a relational store? Yeah, I think this is you know very very good question. So so in the last few months, actually, I have been you know like revisiting some of the use cases and talked to a lot of you know tech graph solution. And I feel in general, if you allow me to answer this question, I, I would answer this question from three different perspectives. I think this is where also sort of to clarify the difference between relational database and the graph database. 
-hmm. So I, I would say, you know, the, the, the number one advantage, which is actually how I look at this is, you know, basically graph modeling actually at the highest level. So graph model providing a very like semantic enriched way to describe the data. So let, let, let me, uh, you know, kind of going through like Euclid this point a little bit further. So, so basically, if you look at the ER diagram, which is actually universal model, how we describe the data, right? So, but when we transform the data from the ER diagram to relational schema, so there's clearly a great benefit of using relational database on the operational level. But one of the disadvantage is we transform everything of the, the ER diagram. So all the edge in the ER diagram was sort of lost, right? We have to use key and the foreign key to represent. We use table, mm -hmm. then key and the foreign key to recover those relationships. Yeah. So those, those important ER diagram relationship was not explicitly recorded in the relational database. Mm -hmm. It's always we have to recover that through the joint relationship. So on the other side, once user using the graph modeling, even for the same type of data, because graph using the vertex and the edge, which have the co more direct correspondence to the ER diagram. So the semantic meaning of that model, which is actually much more cl clear, okay? So so it, so that makes, I think, graph schema a better choice of more, it, since it's providing a more holistic and more knowledge enriched or semantically enriched data representation. Okay, so then that's number one. So number two is when when user develops a query, if you compare how they usually write in using the join form, using the SQL, you know, which basically I, we, we tried both. We use relational to write it because those sophisticated join, it's very hard for on one side to write those queries. Uh, in the same time, even you read that query, <laughs> just to recover that meaning is not straightforward. But in the meantime, the, the, because the, the graph query, which can allow users to write what the business process, what the underlying process mean, as we use what I say is an edge, an aggregation group by all of those. So, so it's a much easier way to describe what the data scientist wants. Okay. And it can allow them to write, you know, like multiple join or, or like multiple join different aggregation queries all in together you know, rather elegant GSQL query. So, so basically the representation power of the GSQL, I think it was never explicitly discussed, mm. which was impressed me actually quite a bit when I revisit what nowadays the, the, the telegraph was offering. Mm -hmm. So number three is, you know, you know, from the data representation, from the, 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 you know, the query representation, now gets back to the, you know, finally is the scalability and the performance. So partially, you know, from the academics, I would also argue. So, I mean, we really, it's all, all the operators are actually relational operators. So, but then what's new? So what you, what the graph database was really doing is, especially Tiger Graph, was sort of be able to fuse a, co a set of operators. We call, in, in relational database, we call operator fusion because Tiger Graph actually compiled the operators and fuse them into a very efficient format. That's the start of the secret, the recipe allow, you know, in relational database, the same query we have to run, you know, for hours, which now you can, you know, like uh, implement in, you know, running on telegraph for like uh, seconds. So really and, the scalability and the performance. Yeah, I heard you mention multiple times that telegraph has the ability to traverse multiple hops, even 10, 12, 15 hops in a single basically execution unit, as opposed to in relational databases, you have to do these very complex multi-table, even same table rejoins, where it becomes a fairly, fairly expensive operation and fairly lengthy to execute. Okay, so let me transition to the other parts that I wanted to ask you about, which is, I know you're working on what's called the financial crime library. What what do you mean by the financial crime library and the solution kits underneath it? Right, right, right. I think let me draw a compare region. So so basically when you know relational database was you know started, especially in the 80s, in the 90s, when the use case become common, so it emerged of you know like a CRM, you know, the customer relationship management and the ERP together, you know, part of this also the, the supply chain management. So mm -hmm. 
so there is a standardization process in the in the nineties. You know, then then really like almost complete in the you know about ten years ago. So so in this process, you can imagine all the use cases in CRM in ERP they all share a lot of common schemas. So was the database vendor like Oracle, SAP recognize that they, they standardize the schema, they building the mm. sophisticated SCR as as supply chain manual, a CRM and the ERP, you know, mm. for those on those database. Mm. So I think a similar things I, I draw is as we start working with bank in financial industry, for instance, anti-fraud, you can imagine we start to observe a lot of similar patterns. So basically mm. the users which you know, for different financial institutes, all of their underlying schemas actually share a lot of similarity. So it doesn't, and some of them, you know, have slight variants. So it doesn't make sense for each of them. This is in the past, Tegograph was helping each individual customer develop their own graph schema. But as we continue incurring more and more uh, schemas, we see the similar pattern. So it's really in this sense, we feel there's a, there's a need which actually we can rather we, we can standardize those graph schemas for financial industry. So this is how we how we started this, this process of actually building what we call super schema for the anti-fraud uh, use case for, for banks. And, yes. and once clearly, as you can see, once we have those schemas, we are building a list of standard queries because those features and yeah. algorithms we are using, which are also, you know, the same. You know, very similar to each other. So so then we can sort of allow everybody to use similar things without writing them every single time. Got it. That makes sense. Okay. I also, Ruming, I heard that you are intending as part of this effort to open source some of these financial crime solutions as solution kits. Can you tell me a bit more as to what does that mean and why are you doing it? Yeah. So, so this is really, uh, you know, I think this is also I can draw a similar com comparison because I think any time when we have the, you know, like when we have the, the same results or the same schema was applied for different settings, we would encourage everybody or, or the entire industry moving to a standardization. I think mm -hmm. Tegraph was really at the forefront, essentially, by providing customers the standardized, you know, you know, graph schema, and for them to, you know, apply this. In different settings, so that's why you know we we have plans to open source our graph schemas similar as uh, the graph queries. So basically, anybody when they were you know like want to deal with the anti fraud uh, use cases, they can they can use those as reference, even you know without necessarily using Tegraph. Got it. Awesome. So the idea then is to solicit community involvement to make those proposed schemas even richer and more applicable to most of the customers in the financial sector, basically. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Now, last question. What's your vision in this space? If you think about financial crime, if you were to think about a year or two mm -hmm. down the road, what would you like to see happen? Yeah, I think, you know, on one side, you know, fighting fraud is a massive undertaking, which, you know, involve it is, uh, you know, nowadays, you know, I think uh, anybody in the industry understand that we are not fighting with the individual people. We are actually fighting likely billionaire, <laughs> billion dollar industry, you know. So so I think this is take a systematic efforts from everybody in the industry. So what I think is the better approach is, you know, as we standardize the different like schemas, I think different different unit, different financial institutes would adopt similar ones, then I think the benefit of that is for the next step in a two or three year or one or two year is really for them to be able to exchange or share information more easily. So there's two parts I think immediately or, or some of the efforts already taking is, you know, like the financial institute can actually share blacklist or gray list, which allows them to actually work with each other so they can still build in their own data model without, you know, like complete, uh, like violating any privacy, but in the same time, everybody can work more efficiently. Um, but also this is, I think it tie really well with the, the, the latest efforts of uh, we call federated learning. So potentially, uh, I think ultimately if, you know, basically everybody can still sharing their data locally, but in the same time, the entire community can actually develop one large single model, which can be shared 
through different communities, through different institutes, so they can fight the financial fraud more effectively. I think that if, if we can really change that, that will make a very big difference. That's, that's incredible. I'll definitely look forward to that. Well, anyway, Ruming, I'm really grateful for you spending the time with us today. This was a very enlightening and, and educational discussion. So thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. All right, awesome. Take care.